And welcome to the program. This is the program that we call Radio for the Remnant, where we help you understand the times, contend for the faith, and become watchmen on the wall. We're going to do something just a little different again this weekend. I'm going to be playing the message given by Pastor J.D. Farag at Understanding the Times 2018, back on September 29th. Uh, The title of his message is Jerusalem, God's Prophetic Time Clock. Not going to waste any time here and move right on into Pastor J.D. Farag at our conference last fall. So I don't want to get emotional. I'm uh, kind of an emotional guy, but I just uh, want to take this opportunity to thank you, Jan. You have no idea how God has used you in the lives of so many, and it's evidenced by this conference that we have every year. I spent a lot of time seeking the Lord about what he would have me to talk about this year and what he impressed upon my heart was the significance of Jerusalem. Over the past several months, I've sensed that the Lord was drawing my attention to Jerusalem in particular as God's prophetic clock, as Jan always says, the clock is Israel, the our hand is Israel, the minute hand is Jerusalem, and the second hand is the Temple Mount. In other words, you want to know what time it is on God's prophetic clock, you need look no further than to Israel, specifically Jerusalem, even more specifically as it relates to the Temple Mount. When you peel back all the geopolitical layers, as it were, I would argue that at the core, what you're going to find is the centrality of the city of Jerusalem. It's all about Jerusalem. That's where the goalposts are. That's where the end zone is, to borrow that sports metaphor. If you were to ask me what I thought was one of the best indicators of how close we are to the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ, my answer would be, Jerusalem. And I'll explain why. Not only does everything center on Jerusalem, the last seven years of human history, as we know it, will come to an end in Jerusalem. That's not the end, because for all eternity, we're in the new Jerusalem. Again, it's all about Jerusalem. My prayer and my hope, and I this morning got up early, in fact, I got up, I was telling my wife on the phone last night, I got up at midnight in Hawaii. Yeah. (laughs) So this is a five-hour time difference. And the Lord just kind of stopped me and said, I I don't want you to spend as much time preparing as I want you to spend praying. So I spent in my hotel room a time just seeking the Lord, praying. And what the Lord ministered to me was that... We need to be encouraged in the Lord. I think about what the Apostle Paul said to the Thessalonians in the context of the rapture. He goes on to talk about in chapter 4 how that we're all going to, we who are alive and remain, are going to be caught up, raptured up. And then he says after that, therefore encourage one another with these words. You know, I have the opportunity to get to talk with many of you. I wish I had more time. And um, so many of you, I I know some of you have shared with me about the very difficult and painful trials that you're in in your life. And I just want to say to you, and maybe this is a word for somebody here today, God knows. God knows what you're going through, and God knows how painful it is. God knows about that son or that daughter that's away from you and away from the Lord. He knows about your marriage and the conflict and the turmoil in your marriage. He knows what you're going through. He knows the pain. And he loves you. He loves you so much. I think of David who encouraged himself in the Lord. I want you to be encouraged. And that's my prayer for today, especially for those of you who are going through a very painful time in your life. What I want to do is connect the dots between the significance of Jerusalem and the imminence of the pre-tribulation rapture. And I want to draw your attention to Zechariah chapter 12. I won't read it in the interest of time. I think you know it well. 
It's a prophecy concerning Jerusalem and how that God himself will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness, the intoxicating obsession of the entire world. And this intoxicating obsession with Jerusalem of all cities will be with respect to the dividing of the city of Jerusalem. And it's very interesting what God says because he says through the prophet, all who would heave it away, dare I say, give it away. Listen to this. (laughs) He says, will surely be cut in pieces. Oh, this is personal. It is. And that's what I want to talk about. But in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter and the third verse, the Apostle Paul is talking, again, in the context of the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. And he says, while they are saying two words, specifically two words, peace and security. Now, in the original language of the Greek New Testament, it's the Greek word asphalia, which can be translated safety or security. So there's going to be two words that they are going to be saying on the world stage at the time of the end, and those two words will be peace and security. And he says, while they're saying those two words, sudden, key word, destruction, will come upon them, another key word, not us, them, as a woman travailing in labor, and they, not us, will not escape. Two key prophecies that I sort of want to tie together. And to do so, I want to begin with this observer report, quoting UN ambassador. You're already laughing because you already read the... I mean, it's kind of funny, actually. He's comparing the UN General Assembly to speed dating. But after she did that, she said this, and I quote, What I can tell you is that this is the week we all wait for, where we can all put U.S. interests in the spotlight, make it a really big prominent thing with all the administration coming in. They are going to come and do their thing, and we're all going to try to see if we can get some good peace and security and agreements passed. This was the week leading up to the U.N. General Assembly, which commenced on Tuesday. And to Haley's credit, she did represent President Donald Trump honestly and accurately. I want to read just a couple of excerpts from the president's address at the UN General Assembly. This year, quoting, we also took another significant step forward in the Middle East in recognition of every sovereign state to determine its own capital. I moved the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. And he did it on the 70th anniversary on May 14th this year. He goes on, and I quote, The United States is committed to a future of, here it is, peace and stability in the region, including peace between the Israelis and, I'm adding this, the so-called Palestinians. You'll forgive me, but here's the thing. I was raised all my life, born to an Egyptian father and a so-called Palestinian mother, born in Beirut, Lebanon, immigrated to the United States legally. (laughs) And I was taught all my life that I was... Egyptian and Palestinian. And then I came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ at age 19 and began to read the Word of God and realized, and you'll forgive my English, my Arabic's not any better. In fact, no, for real. Amir's Arabic puts my Arabic to shame. Shame on me. But you'll forgive my English. There ain't no such thing as a Palestinian. If you join me late, we're playing the message given by Pastor J.D. Farag, Calvary Chapel, Kaneohe, Hawaii, given at Understanding the Times 2018 back on September 29th. Title message, Jerusalem, God's Prophetic Time Clock, back to Pastor J.D. So if you don't mind, I will refer to them as the so-called Palestinians. 
moving forward. Quoting the president, he continues, We believe that when nations respect the rights of their neighbors and defend the interests of their people, they can better work together to secure the blessings of, here it is again, safety, prosperity, and peace. We must pursue peace without fear, hope without despair, and security without apology. So this was on Tuesday. Subsequent to the U.S. President's address, leaders of other nations echoed this clarion call for the exact two words that the Apostle Paul said they would be saying prior to and simultaneous with the sudden destruction that would come down upon them. Listen to this. Erdogan, Turkey. Peace and stability, quoting. Macron, new world order and security. Macron, peace and security. Macron, Palestinian two-state solution. Jordan, peace and stability. Jordan, Palestinian two-state solution. This is at the UN this last week. Jordan, this is interesting. Jerusalem, not New York. Jerusalem is not only Jordan's problem, but yours also, speaking of the UN. Jerusalem, this burdensome stone, this boundary stone that is the burden of the entire world. It's a problem. What are we going to do about the Jerusalem problem? Answer, peace and security. Jordan, peace and prosperity. Qatar. Peace and security, Qatar. Security and stability, Qatar. And this is very interesting. <laughs> Palestinians, so-called, last vestiges of a colonial past. Jerusalem, balance of power between the occupied and the occupier. Qatar, two-state solution. Qatar, peace and security. Iran. Peace and security. Iran. Palestine occupation. Peace and stability. And last, Finland. If you're from Finland, we love you. We just want you to know that. Peace and security. And you'll forgive the bluntness with which I say this, but to me, the two-state solution is Hitler's final solution repackaged. They do not want peace with Israel. They do not want a two-state solution with Israel living side by side in peace and security. They do not want peace with Israel. They want the destruction of Israel. This is Hitler's final solution repackaged. It's just got new wrapping paper on. Did you know that Jerusalem is not mentioned even one time in the Quran? Oh, they try. They try to interpret the Quranic texts to say that, well, there's this one reference, and oh, it's the ancient language of Arabic. That's the problem. But it, it talks about the distant land. That's Jerusalem. Well, they call it Jerusalem. Just one time. Not one time. It's not even mentioned one time. You know how many times Jerusalem is mentioned in the Word of God? 806 times. 806 times. How's that one? For those of you who are into this, here, here's the numbers. And you know who you are, by the way. Don't raise your hands. We, know, we, we love you too. 660 times in the Old Testament, 146 times in the New Testament. Not one time in the Quran. I had to get that off my chest. I feel a lot better. Thank you so much. <laughs> now here's the question. Why? It's the why question. Why does Islam lay claim to it and why is the world obsessed and intoxicated with it? Answer, Jerusalem is the city that the God of Israel has chosen to put his name on. And it validates and authenticates his ownership of the eternal city of Jerusalem. Stay with me on this. Have you ever wondered why there's no such thing as a counterfeit $70 bill? 
No, I know that's kind of dorky, but no, think about it, right? Have you ever seen, a, why is there not a counterfeit $70 bill? Because there's no such thing as a genuine $70 bill. Why is there counterfeit $100 bill? Because there's a genuine $100 bill. What's my point? Maybe you're asking, do you even have a point? I do, just give me a second. <laughs> Islam is the counterfeit. It's an illegitimate claim and validate the genuine. By virtue of the fact that you have the counterfeit, that means there's got to be the genuine. Other speakers that day were Amir Sarafati, Pastor Jack Hibbs, Billy Crone, Eric Barger, and yours truly. And we have complete sets of DVDs and CDs, but we do recommend the DVDs because of the PowerPoint used. And you can visit the products category at olivetreeviews.org or give my office a call central time and we'll get those out to you quickly. Back in just a couple of minutes and more with Pastor Farag. On today's Understanding the Times radio, you're hearing a message Pastor J.D. Farag first delivered at our last Understanding the Times conference last September. Please remember this broadcast is posted to our website every Saturday morning. You can listen to it at olivetreeviews.org. Also at olivetreeviews.org, you can sign up for our newsletter and our e-news alerts. As we begin this new year, our commitment to you is to bring you biblical insights on discerning the signs of the last days. We are dedicated to enhancing your understanding of the end times. We do that once a week here on this radio station and online around the clock. Please remember us in prayer and in your charitable giving this year. We welcome your correspondence at Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. To handle your questions about this ministry, staff personnel are available Monday through Friday at 763-559-4444. Jen returns with more fall conference memories from Pastor J.D. Farag right after this brief timeout. Thanks for supporting this radio outreach, now heading into its 19th year. There is a common misperception that radio stations actually pay hosts of programs like Understanding the Times Radio, when in fact, programs like this deal with serious weekly radio costs. If you would like to underwrite this program, give us a call Monday through Friday, Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. Or just give conveniently online at olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. You can always drop a tax-deductible check to Olive Tree Ministries. Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Proclaiming both the news and the good news this year. I think you would agree with me that, especially as of late, and especially here in the U.S., the political noise so to speak, makes it really difficult to discern what really matters, what's really going on. I am personally of the belief that, and it's getting increasingly worse, that much of what we see taking place today is actually a, and I'll just say a demonic distraction from what really matters. Now let's return to Pastor J.D. Farag as he continues the message he first delivered at last fall's Understanding the Times conference. If you just joined me, we're playing a conference message given last September 29th here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We had about 4,000 in attendance from across America, Canada, and some foreign nations at Understanding the Times 2018. We're going to head right back to Pastor J.D. Farag's message from that conference titled, Jerusalem, God's Prophetic Time Clock. Now, God has not only put his name of ownership on Jerusalem, literally, He's also put his name of ownership on his people eternally. If you'll kindly permit me to, I want to share with you some fascinating forensic evidence of God's name on his city and his people. First, his people. One of the highest blessings that you can 
pronounce on someone in the Middle East, in my Arab culture and certainly in the Jewish culture, is to pronounce the name of God on someone. Growing up, my mom, who I loved very much, used to say to me in Arabic, Bism Allah alik. There's only one problem with that. Bism Allah alik means the name of Allah is upon you. I don't, <laughs> I don't want the name of Allah upon me, so I changed it. Ism Yasua, we say in Arabic Yashua, Ism Yasua alik. The name of Jesus is upon you. You know, I, I love it when Amir does this. He did it again today. And I mean, just the ironic blessing in Numbers. He always ends those updates with the ironic blessing. I tell you, it, it's, again, I'm going to use a, a Hawaii thing. It's chicken skin, a.k.a. goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing that, Amir. <laughs> and we know the ironic blessing. We probably don't know it in Hebrew, but we know that every time the Israelites would meet at the tent of meeting that Aaron would pronounce that he wanted to bless his people. And when my boys, when they were little, I used to pronounce this blessing upon them. And we actually, well, I came up with this song and I would always sing it to them. And it went like this. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace, and give you peace. A little more abrupt than uh, Amir's uh, <laughs> Hebrew. This might explain some of the problems they had later in life. I think I traumatized them. <laughs> I sought to bless them. I ended up, I don't know. But here's the thing. Here's this blessing pronounced upon God's people. And listen to what else God declared he wanted to bless his people with. Listen to this. So they shall put my name, my name, on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. My name. Well, that's the name of God on the people of God. Let's talk about the name of God on Jerusalem. Second Chronicles 6, the first part of verse 6, I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. Second Chronicles 12, second part of verse 13, he, speaking of Rehabon, reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all of the tribes of Israel, put his name there. Second Chronicles 33, second part of verse 7. In Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. Second Kings 21, first, second part of verse 4. In Jerusalem will I put my name. Okay, what's God's name? I hope you know that God is his title. That's not his name. By the way, Allah is not the title of God in Arabic. That's the name of the false god of Islam. And Muhammad is a false prophet. And Islam, a false religion. It's a counterfeit religion. That's the truth. So what's God's name? Okay. The scriptures are not silent. When it comes to the nature of God, we know the name is the nature. And as such... There are many names that are attributed to God. However, one such name is El Shaddai. Of this, one commentator wrote, It is generally accepted that Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It is commonly accepted that Job lived, and this is interesting, during the patriarchal age and possibly even predated Abraham. For Job... A common name for God was El Shaddai. Pastor Mark Martin, he's the pastor of Calvary Chapel, Phoenix in Arizona. He explains it this way. The Hebrew letter Sheen is used by the Jews as the abbreviation for the name El Shaddai. The old city of Jerusalem resembles the shape of the Sheen, which means 
that God Almighty literally put his name in and upon Jerusalem. Exactly as he said. Okay, you know what the Hebrew sheen looks like? Looks like our W. And this is where it gets really interesting. I want you to consider the following images of the old city of Jerusalem as outlined by the city walls. And I want to superimpose the Hebrew sheen upon the city of Jerusalem. The name of God upon exactly as he said, Jerusalem. Here's the first one. It's an aerial. And I want you to notice the second part of it. Again, the name is the nature. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Notice the second part of that, the second person of the Trinity, right there on the Temple Mount. Here's another one. It's a wood carving, and you'll forgive the resolution on the images. I hope it shows up okay. But here again, you can see the sheen superimposed upon the city of Jerusalem. Here's an aerial, and there's the sheen. Now, it gets even more interesting. Not only is the name of God upon the city of Jerusalem, it's also upon the three valleys around Jerusalem. Pictured here is the Hinnom Valley, the Tiro Poyon Valley. Am I pronouncing that right? Thank you. See, this is why I need my Jewish brother. And the Kidron Valley. And there's the sheen. Here's another one, and I circled the Temple Mount area, and you can see the sheen and the three valleys. Here's an artist's rendition from about 150 years ago, actually, showing the topographical features of Jerusalem with the three valleys. And lastly, here's another view, clearly showing the sheen, the abbreviation for El Shaddai, the principle of first mention for the name of God literally upon Jerusalem. Remember, Israel is God's timepiece. Jerusalem is the minute's hand, and the Temple Mount is the second hand. So that's why we keep our eye on the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. And that is what J.D. Farag is doing in this conference message given just a few months ago. We'll wrap it up here in the next few minutes. I want to connect the aforementioned prophetic dots of Jerusalem and the rapture and explain how I get there. It's been said that the purpose of the tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation. It's also been said that while the Christ-rejecting world is in the seven-year tribulation, the bride of Christ is in the seven-year marriage celebration. Perhaps better said, while the world is tribulating, I know that's not a word, but let's just say it is. (laughs) While the world is tribulating, we're going to be celebrating. Here's where I'm going with all of this. Once the church is removed, God's final plan for Israel is fulfilled in the seven-year tribulation. And as such, when everything concerning God's final plan is lining up and even speeding up, we can and should be looking up. The best illustration I ever heard was this. When you see all of the signs up for Christmas, you can look up and lift up your head because Thanksgiving draws nigh. (laughs) No, right? Is that weird? No, it's not. In other words, when you see the world and all of the signs are up for the seven-year tribulation... And the rapture must happen before the seven-year tribulation. And and the rapture's Thanksgiving. And you see all the signs up for Christmas. Thanksgiving's close! Yes! Let me try to tie this all together. The signs are up for the seven-year tribulation so that we can know that our seven-year wedding celebration draws nigh. To me, one of the most fascinating and convincing proofs of the pre-tribulation rapture, and there are many, but one of the most compelling is that of the ancient Jewish wedding customs, which paint this magnificent picture of the rapture. 
So what follows is a brief explanation of the typology specific to why it is that the rapture must happen before the seven-year tribulation. Here's the first one, and I have many of these. I sort of abbreviated it. With the Jewish wedding, there's a marriage covenant, ketubah. It's made in writing for the bride as a promise to the bride that it will be fulfilled. With our wedding, so too is this true. We have the new covenant in writing, in God's written word for us as the bride and the old covenant promise is fulfilled as Amir had referenced earlier. And by the way, I, let me parenthetically say, and Jan talks about this often, I very much appreciate it. God is not through with the Jew. Yes. And oh, by the way, you don't want God to be through with the Jew. Do you want to know why? Because God has a covenant with the Jew. And so too does God have a covenant with me and you too. And if God is through with the Jew, then what about you? <laughs> How secure how secure are you? At the engagement, or if you prefer, the betrothal, they would break bread and drink from the cup. This is the communion table. He breaks bread with us, and we drink from the same cup at, as we affectionately refer to it, the Last Supper, which seals his new covenant in his blood. I am struck by Luke's account of the Last Supper on that Passover, when Jesus two times says that he eagerly awaits when this that they're doing is fulfilled in his kingdom. He's talking as the bridegroom to the bride. I can't wait for our wedding day. The Jewish wedding, the groom pays the price, mohar, showing the bride his love for her. You might see this as a dowry, the price that the groom pays. You know where I'm going with this. Jesus paid the price for us on the cross in full. It gets better. The groom, after the engagement, goes to his father's house and prepares a place for his bride. But when Jesus said, behold, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many mansions. He's talking as the bridegroom to the bride. I'm going to prepare our bridal chamber. And I will come and I will take you. And there you will be with me also. I can't wait. Yeah. It gets better. <laughs> if you can imagine. So, oh, I think I skipped one. This is a very important one. Got a little excited there. So the father is the only one who knows the day or the hour that the groom returns for his bride. This was a problem for wedding invitations because, <laughs> you know, I, date, don't know. <laughs> Time, don't know. Just be ready. Oh, with our wedding, Jesus said, no one but the Father knows the day or the hour. Then, when? <laughs> when the bridegroom comes, the groomsmen would run ahead and shout that he's coming. And they would blow the shofar, the trumpet that we heard earlier today. The groom is coming. When our bridegroom comes, it will be with a shout of the trumpet of God. By the way, and again, Amir, thank you for delineating between the two trumpets. There's the trumpet of angels for Israel, the trumpet of God for the church. Amen. The trumpet of God. Jesus is coming. And when that trumpet sounds, that's when the dead in Christ rise first. By the way, I'm so blessed to have talked with those of you who have, like me, lost a child. I want to say to you that 1 Thessalonians 4 is for you and for me too. 
That's why Paul says, encourage one another with these words. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And they're going to have their new bodies. Those of you that have lost sons and daughters, those of you that have lost loved ones, in the bodily resurrection, they will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet them and Jesus in the air. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. So the groom snatches away and abducts his bride as a thief in the night, which is why she must always be ready. That's how it's going to be for us. Jesus, our bridegroom, will rapture us away as he abducts us as his bride. And remember, we do have plans for 2019, Saturday, September 21st. Featured speakers include Amir Sarfati, Pastor J.D. Farag returns, Pastor Jack Hibbs, Dr. Robert Jeffress. I'll have a message as well. Tickets will go on sale sometime next summer, but not before. You can check for those updates at our website, olivetreeviews.org. And uh, you can listen for updates here on air in our various newsletters as well. But save the date, at least for now, Saturday, September 21st, 2019. We're going to wrap up J.D. Farag when I return. Understanding the Times is now heard in over 830 radio markets across the USA. Every weekend, we're reminding people about the good news of Jesus Christ and his soon return. We love to hear from our listeners. You can contact us at olivetreeviews.org or when you write to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Every year begins a new challenge to reach more people by radio and the internet. We're growing to meet the demand for telling the inconvenient truth from God's Word. Tell others about this program. Let's make 2019 a year to tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ. As we bring these timely messages your way each week, please remember to pray for this listener-supported broadcast ministry. We're reachable by phone at 763-559-4444. Please stay with us for Jan's final segment coming right up. I have watched the tide of our times deteriorate for decades. Some say we are in the time period known as the beginning of sorrows, but that actually comes later in God's clock and calendar. Still without an eternal perspective, people are discouraged today, and that is why Hebrews 10 tells us to encourage one another. Olive Tree Ministries has products that will help you do that. Visit our website, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. We have books and DVDs that are uplifting and that will remind you that the King is coming soon and the darkness will turn to dawn. If you want to stay up to date, also check our daily headlines posted hourly every day. The sons of Issachar in 1 Chronicles 12 were men who understood the times. God wants us to be in the know, up to date, and looking at events that cause us to await His return. We return now to the conclusion of J.D. Farag and his fall conference message titled, Jerusalem, God's Prophetic Clock. Again, we have complete sets of DVDs of our September 29th event. They include this message by Pastor Farag and message by Amir Sarfati, Pastor Jack Hibbs, Pastor Billy Crone, Eric Barger, and I shared very briefly all of those available on DVD. Also CD, but we do encourage the DVDs. And um, you can just give my office a call or go to the store at olivetreeviews.org. We're going to wrap up the hour now with J.D. Farag. I'll be back shortly to close the hour. And here's where I want to kind of bring it in for a landing. I know that Arabs shouldn't use airplane, again, illustrations, but I'm going (laughs) to find a runway and land this plane, okay? (laughs) And I've only got a few minutes to do it. The groom takes his bride to that place that was prepared for her in his father's house, and they consummate and celebrate their marriage for a period of seven days. Jesus will come back for us and take us to that place he prepared for us, that bridal chamber, where we will celebrate 
and consummate, if you will, our marriage to the Lamb for seven years. Seven. Not three and a half. Don't mess with the typology. Ask Moses about that. God commands him the first time to strike the rock. The rock is Christ. The water comes out. The second time, he says, you don't need to strike the rock. The Christ is only struck, crucified once. Now you can speak to the rock. What does Moses do? He strikes it. You know what it cost him, right? The promised land. This might be mean, but for those who mess with the typology specific to the pre-tribulation rapture, I'll leave it at that. I'm going to leave it right there for you and the Holy Spirit. Don't mess with the typology. Joseph took a Gentile bride before the seven-year famine. A picture, a type of Christ. How about this one? Three Hebrew slaves, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as we know them, are in the seven times hotter furnace and are saved in the midst of the seven, not three and a half times hotter furnace. Not pre-wrath furnace. The seven times hotter furnace. Where's Daniel? Oh, he was taken up and exalted pre-furnace. Daniel's a type of the church. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are a type of Israel. They go into the seven times hotter furnace. They go into the seven-year tribulation. The purpose of the tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation. Don't mess with the typology. There, I said it. Now let's move on. <laughs> After the seven, there's this big feast, the wedding feast. After the seven, these um, uh, post toast, I mean, post tribulation, uh, <laughs> y- you want to talk about messing, don't, don't mess with the wedding. And by the way, there's going to be food in heaven. This brings me great joy and comfort and right? But if the rapture was at the end of the seven-year tribulation, this is a drive through uh, <laughs> This is not a feast. This is fast food, not a... Okay, I, I digress. <laughs> but we too, after the seven-year tribulation, celebrate the marriage feast supper of the Lamb. And that's when it is that we will partake with him as his bride by his side when it is fulfilled in his kingdom. You see how that all fits? Well, it gets even better. The new home of the bride was Jerusalem. And it was the bridegroom who came to the bride to dwell with her in Jerusalem. It's from the new Jerusalem that Jesus, our bridegroom, will dwell with us forever and ever. One last thing. You know how when there's a marriage, the husband gives the wife a new name? His name is upon her. My wife has never forgiven me. (laughs) No, because her maiden name was Lynn. How nice is that? And here I come along, I marry her, and I change it to frog. <laughs> I keep telling her, you know, in heaven, it's, you know, it's a moot point because we're all going to have his name. <laughs> but that's how those dots connect. And that's why it is that Jerusalem is central. The city that God chose out of all of the tribes of Israel to put his name upon. This is why it is that the rapture of the bride of Jesus Christ must happen before the seven-year tribulation. Because once the church is removed and we're raptured, then God shifts all the focus of his attention upon his people, Israel, to fulfill that 70th week Last time I checked, there are seven days in a week. That 70th week of Daniel, yet future, soon and very soon to be fulfilled. I've been privileged 
to have this opportunity, and I thank you, Jim, for giving me this opportunity to share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ. It may very well be, and I know we have that, a lot of what you've heard today from the other speakers was such that God just really opened your heart to the truth, and it made sense. And it's no accident, by the way, for those of you that are here, maybe you were invited to come. A friend brought you. You're not here by coincidence. You're here by God's providence for such a time as this. And I want to share with you today how it is that you too can have the name of the Lord upon you by calling upon the name of the Lord. Because only those that have called upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And I want to share with you how to be saved. And I want to do so by way of the ABCs of salvation. Before I do, I want to share with you something that happened just right before I came up to speak. And I, I have her permission to share this. But she had led this friend to the Lord... And she used the ABCs of salvation. And she gave her life to Christ and was born again. And on a Sunday, she was worshiping in church. And 24 hours later, she was murdered by her husband, who then subsequently committed suicide. But she's in the presence of the Lord. You know, it may not be that you're amongst those who are alive and remain that are caught up at the time of the rapture. Our lives in this world are brief. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. I don't want to be morbid. I just want to be truthful and honest with you. There's no guarantees for tomorrow. I just want to share one more. When I was uh, very young, in my 20s, I served at this orphanage. There were many boys, and I, I took a liking to this uh, young 13-year-old African-American boy. And uh, he was in the foster care system, and I just shared the gospel with him, and I prayed with him, and I had just the honor and the privilege of leading him to Jesus Christ. That very next week, they went on a field trip, and they went swimming. It was in the summer, and he drowned. And I was so glad that I had shared the gospel with him on that day prior to his home going. You never know. You never know. It's childlike simple. Jesus said that you must become like a little child to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not childish, childlike. It's so simple. It's ABC simple. And the acronym of the ABCs are the A is for admit or acknowledge that you're a sinner and that you need the Savior, I think it was Jack that mentioned, this is repentance, it's that change of mind. And when you change your mind, God changes your heart. Admit or acknowledge that you're a sinner and in need of a Savior. Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23 says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. We were all born sinners, which is why we must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but, and here's the good news, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me just explain that for just a moment. That's the good news. The, the word gospel means good news. Your debt has been paid. You're free. Good news. That's what gospel means. What debt's been paid? Oh, the death penalty. See, that's the bad news. We've all been sentenced to death because all have sinned. That's the bad news. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But here's the good news. Jesus Christ came. He was crucified. This is the gospel. He was crucified, buried, and rose again on the third day and is coming back one day. That's the good news. The B 
is for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. This is Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will, not might, not could, not should, you will be saved. That's the B. And here's the C. The C is for call upon the name of the name of the Lord. Or, if you prefer, as Romans 10, 9 and 10 also says, confess with your mouth. I don't mean to be so blunt, but every tongue is going to confess one day. Every knee is going to bow. It's better that you confess now. I'm just saying, you don't want to confess when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And here's why. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And lastly, Romans 10, 13. Can I say it this way? This is what seals the deal. All who call upon the name, the name of the Lord will be saved. For me, that was over 36 years ago. And I actually, is Eric here? I, I have, this is going to date me, uh, his book about rock and roll music. And that's how I got saved. I was demon possessed by the music that I was listening to, heavily into ACDC, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, the Beatles. Yeah, the Beatles. And I actually realized that Satan was real. And I concluded that if Satan was real, that means Jesus had to be real. And it was on a cold January night. I wasn't in Hawaii yet. <laughs> in 1982, when I called upon the name of the Lord. And that next morning, when I woke up, I was a new creation in Jesus Christ. And I never looked back. <laughs> One last thing. <laughs> Did I say that already? This will be the last, last thing. And this might be for somebody here today. I was addicted to drugs, not proud of this. I was addicted to tobacco. I was addicted to alcohol. I could not start my day, as God is my witness, I could not start my day without the drugs, the tobacco, and I know this is gross, but I would actually drink first thing in the morning. That's how I would start my day. That next morning when I woke up, I went to reach for those things. And now the Holy Spirit was indwelling me. His name, his nature is now upon me. I went to reach for those things and the Holy Spirit in that still small voice, unmistakable, very gentle, spoke and said, you don't need that anymore. You don't need that anymore. You have me. And I never looked back. And that was 36 years ago. Yeah. Yes, Jerusalem is the city of the great king. King Jesus will rule from there for 1,000 years. From Jerusalem, not 